Latvia was an independent and neutral country when it was invaded by Soviet troops in 1940. For the next 50 years, Latvia lived under an oppressive Soviet regime directed from Moscow. Since Latvia restored its independence in 1990, these decaying physical relics are the main reminders of the Soviet occupation. But the mental reminders of the Soviet years have been revived recently by Russia's interference in its neighbours' security, especially in Georgia and Ukraine. NATO Review went to find out what happened to Latvians in those Soviet years and how it affects their view of Russia today. We thought that we'd seen the worst in Georgia. It makes me very sad. This is the first time since the restoration of independence where we really feel a threat. That's definitely a completely new situation. I would never expect a couple of years ago that this would be possible in any part of Europe. For many Latvians, Russia's recent aggressive actions towards its neighbours brings back memories of when the Soviet Union invaded Latvia not once but twice during the Second World War. People in 39 were so convinced that they were safe. It's very sad when you read people's memoirs. Um, that last summer of Latvian independence uh, in 1940 before the Russian troops marched in, uh, they truly were uh, living happy lives and saying we're absolutely safe, nothing, nothing can touch us. When the Soviet regime arrived, one of the first things it did was start to deport any Latvians who it felt were a threat. On the night of the 14th of June 1941, 15,000 Latvians were woken in the night and forced to come to the railway station. And they were pushed into wagons such as these. Of those 15,000, 2,400 were children. As they left, they tried to push out farewell notes and they were scattered on the tracks behind, some of them never actually reaching the families concerned. Of those 15,000 who were transported here, over half would die. Those who wanted to avoid deportation, or worse, escaped. Oyas Eriks Kalnin's family was one of those who escaped. Today, he is chairman of Latvia's Foreign Affairs Committee. My parents lived through the last war. Uh, I ended up growing, in the, growing up in the US, but returned. And I never imagined on returning to Latvia that I would face the same thing that they lived through during World War II. I hope that history doesn't repeat itself. The complacency that some would uh, exhibit by saying, oh, that's, that's the eastern neighborhood, uh, it's their immediate neighbors that are a danger, it doesn't concern us, we're geographically far away, uh, please do not fall into that illusion. Uh, it's a sort of illusion that led to the First and Second World Wars and to many unpleasant things uh, that happened in the world. One of those unpleasant things was the treatment of many Latvians by the KGB. And this is the KGB building in Riga where some of the worst treatment from torture to murder took place. Let me give you an idea of what it would be like to be a prisoner in this KGB cell in Riga. The cell itself is about three meters by five meters. It has four wooden beds here, and the lights would be on permanently, so it would be very difficult to sleep. In fact, the KGB agent looked through the spy hole and saw that the prisoner was asleep. He would come in and wake him up. There was a system of heating downstairs, which meant that the temperature within this cell would be almost unbearable, around 40 degrees. But perhaps one of the worst things about this is that this cell, designed to hold four prisoners, at times held up to 42 of them. And for those prisoners that the KGB really wanted to break, this was the method. A solitary confinement cell of less than one meter by one meter. No opportunity to lie down. Prisoners could be in here for three days. And to make matters even worse, during that time, noises, repetitive noises designed to break the mind, were pumped through, through the ceiling. And this is the exercise yard of the KGB building where one day in every three, if prisoners were lucky, they would be allowed to have a walk and exercise here. However, it would be just for 10 minutes. And even then, whilst they walked, they would be viewed by a patrolling KGB officer above. The reason for this 10 minutes was not to give the prisoners some kind of relief. 
The reason was to show them the freedom that they were missing. And finally, this is the execution room where prisoners were shot when the Nazis came to Riga in 1941 and discovered this building, there were 240 bullet casings on the floor alone. The room has been designed in such a way to be very easy to execute and clean up afterwards as there's a slope down so the blood can be washed away immediately after. And it was in this room that many of the Latvian KGB prisoners, the journey ended for them. Sandra Calnietti's family were less fortunate than those who managed to escape. Her family were deported to Siberia, where she was born. She didn't actually see Latvia until she was age seven. As an adult, she started challenging the system. And one of her most memorable contributions was organizing the human chain across the Baltic states in 1989, which became known as the Baltic Way. The first one was to attract attention of the West and to remind to world society that for Baltic states the Second World War uh, has not ended, that we still are occupied. Um, but another uh, goal, of course, was to show to Moscow that this is our very strong will. It, I think it touched many people. And this was something which during the uh, uh, first 10 years after independence was vastly remembered. I, for instance, I, I made a trip to Morocco and I was buying a sort of something in, in the local souk and uh, I was asked where, where I am from and I said Baltic Sea, Latvia. He said, yeah, he said, answered, he knows, it's where people were holding hands. Independence from the Soviet Union was followed by a quest to join NATO and the effects of joining the alliance were profound. I remember in front of Riga Castle we had a ceremony of raising the, the NATO flag uh, and uh, there were uh, elderly people in the audience openly crying and saying I had been exiled to Siberia. Uh, I have seen how quickly a country can use its lose its independence when it thought itself safe uh, from attack because of its neutrality and prosperity and so on. And uh, I am so relieved now that I feel we uh, have a chance, uh, my grandson whom he held in his arms, uh, that my grandson would not have to go through what I went through uh, in my life. I have a grandson. You know, once he come back, uh, came back from school and he said, is it true that there will be war? You see, even children uh, are afraid. Keeping the next generation informed about what happened to their parents and grandparents is one of Latvia's biggest defences. Uh, I think our schools should remind them uh, of the uh, dangers, but also they should look at the news and what is happening in the world. None of us should feel complacent or entirely uh, safe uh, just because we wish to be. So how do young Latvians see their history? Last year we had an exam about Latvian history about all the Second World War, so I think I actually kind of know. I can't just explain, but I know quite much about these times from my granny, and so it, it's worrying me. And what do they think of what is happening today with Russia? I think everything will be okay, so I'm kind of optimistic about that. I hope so. But things are not black and white in Latvia. It has a significant Russian-speaking minority, which ranges from a quarter to a third of the population. And protecting a Russian-speaking minority was one of the excuses used by Russia to invade both Ukraine and Georgia. The difference of opinions here in Latvia can perhaps be best illustrated by the feelings towards this monument behind me. It was built in 1985, officially to commemorate the victims who died in bringing victory over Nazi Germany in 1945. However, some Latvians see this as a symbol of the old Soviet regime, and indeed there have been more than one attempt to bomb the monument. On the other hand, Russian-speaking Latvians commemorate 9th of May here in their thousands and have vowed to protect the monument. 
And the Latvian Russian speaking community can feel strongly that Russia has been victimized. And this feeling can even be found amongst the minority's younger population. People in, in, in the West, so like America and um, West Europe, uh, they have made this like revolution in Ukraine. And so I don't think that Russia uh, had made something wrong. I think they have made everything right. But regardless of the theories, the fact is that 2014 is Latvia's 10th year in NATO. So what would be happening now if the country hadn't joined the alliance? I don't think I want to imagine that. Uh, I'm glad that that's not a reality anymore. You might have seen either little green men or tanks rolling across our borders. Do you feel that NATO means much more in this part of the alliance? I think it means everything. It means our security. Uh, and it has reasserted itself in our minds. After 10 years, it has uh, proven why we needed to join. And you personally, I've talked to other Latvians who were affected by what happened during the war, after the war. You personally, what does this mean to you to see this kind of thing happening again? Well, uh, it makes me very sad. We really did think it was behind us, you see, and uh, it makes me very sad.